In this video, I'm gonna show you how to put the AI into your AI agent. And by that, I mean, I'm gonna break down all of the components that you need to enable your agent to do intelligent things on your behalf. Now, a lot is spoken about prompts and prompt engineering. And yes, prompts are an important one of these seven components, but there are six other things that are probably just as important as the prompt if your AI agent is gonna do smart things on your behalf. So with that, let's dive in. The first component of making your AI agent intelligent is indeed the prompt. Now prompts are a somewhat technical term. You've probably heard about them in the context of ChatGPT, but a prompt is really just the instructions that you're gonna to give to your AI to tell it what you want it to do. For example, given the content of an email, decide whether it's a cold email trying to sell me something, or given a new customer that just signed up on our website, decide whether we think they're a good fit for our services or not, or given the brief of a blog post, please write the complete blog post for me. And prompting is actually very natural because we've all given instructions to people to do things. We tell them a little bit of context about the task we want them to accomplish. We tell them what we want the end state of the task to be. And then maybe we give some instructions along the way of how we want them to perform the task. And that is the prompt, which is the first of seven components. The second component that we need to give to our AI agent is data. The data is what the AI is gonna use along with the prompt to figure out what it needs to accomplish. So for example, I just mentioned a couple prompts that require some data. Given an email, decide whether it's a cold sales email or not. Well, the data we need to provide is the email. Or given a new customer that signs up on our website, determine whether they're a good fit or not, we need to give the AI the data about that customer, like their domain or their email address or their LinkedIn profile. And if you don't give good data to the AI, it can't possibly make good decisions or create good output on your behalf. Now the data often comes from previous steps in the workflow. For example, the trigger, which I covered in my previous video. So if you have a trigger from an incoming email or a trigger from a new form entry, that is typically gonna be the data that you want to give to your AI to accompany the prompt for it to achieve whatever intelligent goal you set for it. The third component is knowledge. Knowledge is the background information or reference material that the AI may need to use as part of achieving its task. And it's important to separate between data, which I just talked about, and knowledge. Data is the item being acted upon, like the email or the form entry, and you pass the full data along to the AI along with the prompt. Knowledge, on the other hand, is typically a much larger corpus of reference material that the AI can query into as needed. For example, a common use of knowledge is all of our previous support emails or all of our previous blog posts or the blog style guidelines and brand guidelines we have for the company. Now, knowledge is powered by a technology called RAG. You may have heard of RAG, Retrieval Augmented Generation. And all that that means is it describes that the AI is gonna query for just the relevant chunk of your knowledge base that it needs to achieve that task, which is why this knowledge corpus can be so big, so much bigger than the data. And that's why I say knowledge is optional, because in some cases, you really do need a lot of reference material to be able to accomplish a task effectively. But in other cases, you don't actually need separate knowledge. The data itself is enough. The fourth component is also an optional one, but a very powerful one, and it is called tools. Tools refer to the AI's ability to automatically take action in the outside world, like run Google searches or send emails. And that's why I say that these are incredibly powerful, but they also need to be handled with care because a rogue agent can go send 100 emails on your behalf. The way you specify a tool is you articulate what product the tool is happening in and what action is being performed. And then in your prompt, you could say, for example, once you've decided that this email needs to be replied to, automatically send a reply using your reply to email tool. This is definitely an advanced feature that I only recommend people use once they're quite experienced with the basics of prompting and data. Okay, the fifth component is models. And I'm not gonna talk for too long about models because probably by the time you watch this video, there's gonna be a whole new array of models out and it won't make a lot of sense for me to refer back to things that are 
obsolete by the time you're watching it. But let me just quickly talk about some of the different things models can do. You've probably heard of the OpenAI models like the GPT series or the O series. You've probably heard of the anthropic Claude models or the Gemini models. And perhaps you've heard of more specialized models like assembly AI's speech to text or 11 Labs's text to speech or Midjourney's prompt to image generation model. And so when you're picking a model, there's a couple things you want to keep in mind. Number one, does it support the modalities or the use case that I care about? This is especially important if you're doing something other than text like audio or video. Number two, does it have a context window that is big enough for all the data that I want? And then number three, is it at the right price point to quality for what I'm trying to accomplish? Because in general, the more expensive models are also going to be better. What I typically do when I'm doing my own AI explorations is I'll pick a pretty expensive model, like at the time of this recording, Claude Force on it or OpenAI's O3. I'm going to see if the expensive model can do the job. If it can, great. I can always try to optimize for a cheaper model later. But if even the most expensive model can't do the job, then probably the cheaper model won't be able to either. So that's models. The sixth component is extremely important, which is the output. Because if the AI is operating as part of a workflow or an agent, very often the output of what the AI is doing is going to be the input to a subsequent step. For example, let's say you've asked your AI to look at the contents of a PDF invoice and extract the amount, the due date, and the vendor name because you want to write those into a spreadsheet later then you need the output format to account for those three different fields with the right types. There are two basic types of output. You can have text output or you can have structured output. Text output is pretty self-explanatory. Like if you want to write an email or a document or a text message, you can ask the AI to output some text for you. On the other hand, if you want to write data into a spreadsheet or a CRM, you're going to need structured data, which you can think of as like different fields in different columns with different types. And it's really important that you set up your output correctly for two reasons. One, by setting up your output correctly, you give the AI more information in addition to the prompt about what it's supposed to achieve and what the end result is supposed to look like. And number two, if you produce your output correctly, it will make it way easier to make that useful in the next step of the workflow or the agent. That's why output is so important. And last, but certainly not least, is the human in the loop. If the task is low stakes, or if you know the AI is really good at it, sure, just let the AI agent do its work on its own. But if the task is high stakes, or if you're not sure the AI is going to do the job well, you got to have a human in the loop. For example, anytime I have AI produce a social media post or a blog post or an email to a customer, I definitely review it before it goes out. And there's a couple different ways you can set up a human in the loop step. You can make it a yes or no approval, like, yep, AI, you did a good job, or no, go back and try again. You can do a more nuanced repeat prompt where you can say, hey, go back based on this new information I'm giving you and try again. That can be called a refinement use case. Or you can manually edit the output of, for example, the email draft before it moves on to the next step. And you should really think carefully about who the human in the loop should be, how much the human needs to interact with the content of the AI, and whether you want this to happen just initially in sort of a training period, or if you always want a human involved in the agent or workflow. This is super important. I can't stress it enough. In almost all real world cases that are high stakes, you want to have a human in the loop to some degree correcting, training, coaching, or adapting the work of AI before someone else sees it. So now you know the seven components that infuse your AI agent with actual intelligence, the prompt, the data, the knowledge, the tools, the model, the output, and the human in the loop. I hope you found this really valuable and I'll see you in the next one.